But where would the evidence be found? By the 1880s, it was believed this had to be where apes and primitive people lived side by side. And so the search moved from Europe to Southeast Asia and the Dutch island colony of Sumatra, home to both man and ape. In October 1889, the monsoon season was beginning, and no one tried to negotiate the dense rainforest unless they had to. Two years ago, Eugene Dubois had a promising career as a doctor in Amsterdam, but his obsession with human origins had led him to take up the challenge to find the missing link. After abandoning his career and his civilized European home, the great dream had turned into a nightmare. He's invested everything that he had into finding this missing link. Dubois was the worst kind of person to go out to the field because he had no experience. He doesn't know how to teach his crew. He doesn't know how to take care of them. They're out, they're out in the field. It's raining. It's a complete shambles. He'd found caves which he hoped would produce the fossils he was looking for. They hadn't. His engineer had given up digging and all but a few of his convict laborers had run away or were sick. To make matters worse, Dubois had malaria. The same deadly disease had already claimed the life of his first engineer and he was about to lose all patience with the second. His engineer had just lost his workmate and he hadn't been paid for a month, but this meant nothing to Dubois. Poor Eugene, he desperately wants to find something, desperately wants to make a name for himself. He comes up with absolutely nothing. After months in the jungle, Dubois had just a few animal fossils to show for the time and money he'd spent. This is, this is all, yeah, man, here. But this is not me good enough. Dubois had many trials and tribulations, and uh, someone who was not as driven, not as determined, uh, not as obsessed, uh, I'm sure, would have given up and gone home. There is nothing. We have gesucht. And the case is off. Get yourself! Sorry. There are enough men in there. I don't know what so will hear us. You're only in luck and make us think. Oh, a fit and end done! Dubois realized his attempt to find the missing link here had failed, and he fired his engineer. They leave Sumatra and he goes elsewhere, and he, he frankly doesn't know where to look other than somewhere in the East Indies. Two years later, and Dubois had started his search again, this time on the island of Java. Finally, his luck had started to turn. He'd fully recovered from malaria and at last had something to look at. Some fossil teeth, which he believed were extremely old and looked vaguely ape-like. Dubois had a new dig site with a bigger team overseen by the Dutch army. Every so often they brought him material they thought might be of interest. And one day, in October 1891, he got another batch. Oh, well, uh, uh, okay. 
Ti cazzo tu? Sono solo. Uopo. It contained a fossilized skull. Just like Neanderthal 40 years earlier, it was only a skull cap, but like Neanderthal, it sent its discoverer into a frenzy of speculation. Thank you, Bill. The surrounding forests were home to a variety of apes, but he knew that this was not from any known ape. It was too fine. The brain cavity was clearly large yet obviously not a human skull. So, could it be an early human ancestor, closer to our ape-like origins? The only thing he could compare it with in his mind was Neanderthal. The first Neanderthal found was 40,000 years old. Unknown to Dubois, his find was roughly 20 times older, between half a million and a million years old, much more primitive than Neanderthal. But was it any closer to being the missing link? The key, Dubois believed, was the size of the brain. He had a precise mathematical model to determine the missing link. Its brain cavity should be precisely half the size of a human and twice the size of a chimpanzee. But when he calculated the brain cavity of this skull, it was the wrong size too big for the halfway point, therefore too big to be the ape-like creature he had imagined. And more evidence emerged from the site which simply added to the confusion for Dubois. A complete fossilized leg bone. Its shape suggested its owner stood upright and walked on two legs, like a man. Dubois couldn't change his evidence, so he changed his model. He decided that the missing link had to have a brain almost as large as our own. And he was so convinced by his meager evidence that he wrote to the Dutch colonial government announcing that he'd found the missing link. He called it Pithecanthropus erectus, upright walking ape man. one of the most successful hominid species ever to walk the earth. In Africa, 800,000 years ago, and 10,000 miles from where Dubois found his upright walking ape, this is the same species, today called Homo erectus upright walking man. They'd been able to colonize Africa, Asia, and beyond thanks to a unique combination of physical and mental qualities. Standing at around six feet, their bodies were similar in shape to our own, and their brains were about two-thirds the size of ours. Homo erectus was on the verge of becoming human. One of the main reasons for this was diet, because for the first time in our evolution, we had access to the concentrated protein of meat. Yet there's no evidence that Homo erectus was a true hunter. This antelope was most likely scavenged from a leopard kill, the spears used to drive away the predator.
It's believed that our bodies had also been going through some radical changes. For the first time in our evolution, body hair was disappearing, partly because Homo erectus' skin had developed complex sweat glands. This also removed the need to pant in the heat, allowing voices to develop and paving the way for human speech. But it's their stone tools that showed how advanced Homo erectus had become. We find the appearance of a thing called the hand axe, which has been called the, the Swiss army knife of the Paleolithic. This is a multi-purpose tool. It's shaped uh, very consistently, worked on both sides, worked very skillfully, and Erectus developed that um, certainly close to one and a half million years ago. So this was a big advance in technology. These people were part of a larger group, the beginnings of a tribe, but they stayed together as a tight-knit family and there is evidence that they had learned to care for each other through sickness and injury. The leg bone which Dubois found in Java had an unusual scar showing clear traces of damage and repair. It's incredible. It seems to have broken at one point and healed. So whoever it was that owned this leg not only was severely injured but repaired it in their own lifetime. And that's important because if you broke your leg out in the wild, you'd be dead. You'd have no chance of survival, except if you were with a family, if you were with a village, if you were in a society. There's a family system around that individual. There was safety within the family, but the family itself was never far from danger. Leopards used the same rock shelters. As darkness approached, they would become vulnerable, spears or no spears. And a storm was brewing in the hot afternoon that could bring an unwelcome predator in search of shelter. But this storm might also bring something else, a new weapon that shifted the balance of power between our ancestors and their competitors. One of the most important pieces in the human evolutionary puzzle, a gift from nature. Every animal on Earth that had ever encountered fire had run away from it. Homo erectus was at a crossroads of human evolution. If they could do the unimaginable and conquer their instinctive fear, they would harness a new power. They just needed the nerve to reach into the blaze. When humans tamed fire, this was obviously a huge step forward and it must have been a, a remarkable event for people to uh, face up to fire and learn how to control it rather than running away from it, which is the natural instinct. And once they could do that, once they could capture fire and, and eventually even make it at will, uh, this was a huge advance. The impact of fire was enormous on human evolution. The technology of fire gave Homo erectus heat, light, and protection on their travels, helping them to migrate across the world from Africa to Asia and beyond. This is how Eugene Dubois came across